All right. Professor Chirdima, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate your, your expertise and you coming to our panel. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I want to thank the chairs, both uh, Mr. Stone and Chesbro. And Pull the mic a little closer you, to you there. Yes. We're being broadcast, so just okay. make sure everybody can hear us. Thank you. I uh, feel a little funny because I feel like everybody's kind of behind me, <laughs> but I'll try to try to talk this way a little bit to uh, address you. Um, uh, as mentioned, my name is uh, Ron Cherdema, and I am professor and chair of, of the Department of Environmental Toxicology at UC Davis. Um, I'm also co-editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Aquatic Toxicology. I'm here to discuss the science behind oil dispersants and their potential for use in California. Um, in collaboration with OSPER, I have directed research on both the toxicology and effectiveness of dispersants with an emphasis on both Coregis 9500 and 9527, both used in the Deepwater Horizon event, uh, for nearly three decades. A little background. As a toxicologist, I view <clears throat> any chemical as a potential tool, as a potential toxicant as well. Like a power saw, when handled safely, a chemical can be useful. For instance, with a power saw, you can build a house. However, when handled in an unsafe manner, you can also cut off your leg. Uh, a chemical used similarly can also have negative results, as we all know. Thus, we view dispersants as useful tools and focus on identifying the conditions in which they can be used both safely and effectively. Um, as we've talked about a little bit already, the tools in the responder's toolbox include skimmers, combustion, degradation via bacteria commonly, uh, and dispersants. All have important benefits and impacts. And that's what's ultimately the driver. The unique conditions of each spill and the resources threatened govern the tool deemed to have the most desirable benefit versus impact ratio. For instance, a spill in calm seas may be best treated by skimming, whereas a spill in heavy seas might be best left to nature. For moderate sea states, dispersants may be most effective, particularly if skimming is deemed ineffective and marine mammals and birds are threatened. Ultimately, Mother Nature cleans up a spill. <clears throat> Hydrocarbons evaporate, they dilute, they dissolve, they naturally disperse uh, into particles and are degraded by both sunlight and bacteria. Human intervention usually functions to <clears throat> address or assist nature and or divert a spill from critical resources such as marine mammals and birds towards those deemed more resilient. During the Deepwater Horizon event, I served on a NOAA panel charged with developing response recommendations. Being the spill could not technically be cleaned up via skimming, which is often the case, the goal was to divert it from sensitive resources, in this case shorelines, towards those deemed more resilient, in this case offshore areas. The decision revolved around a benefit versus impact consideration as usual, and dispersants were chosen. <clears throat> a bit on the standardized research approach. As dispersant use has been an option for many years, in response to the Lumpert Keene Sea Strand Act, and in coordination with NOAA, the National Marine Fisheries Service, the U.S. Wildlife Service, uh, and stakeholders, OSPER and I initiated the California Oil Spill Research Program. Ultimately, we developed advanced methods using novel systems and chemical analysis to fully characterize dispersant toxicity and effectiveness. In the late 1990s, we developed a broader collaboration with the Marine Spill Response Corporation, Exxon Biomedical, the Texas General Lands Office, and the Universities of Delaware and Florida to standardize our methods for use nationwide. The result was CROSURF, it's an acronym, for Chemical Response to Oil Spills Ecological Effects Research Forum. CROSURF's goal back in the 1990s was to move away from the apples and oranges approach to research of the past and proposed for widespread implementation of advanced methods for use by scientists everywhere, thus making all results directly comparable. The result was that CrowSurf methods have become the most widespread methods used today. And because of this, it placed OSPR at the international forefront of dispersant research. Now, for many years, spill research has been plagued by deficient methods and virtually no chemical analysis. Consider this. If you place oil, oil and water in a blender, dispersion will result. How much oil is actually in the water will depend upon the length of time, speed of the blender, and the temperature. Thus, exact quantities of oil and water do not necessarily produce identical dispersions. 
the apples and oranges problem with much of the current oil spill literature. <clears throat> this underlines the need for standard methods and chemical analysis as represented by crew surf to obtain reliable toxicity and effectiveness information. Knowing oil and water quantities alone provides no useful information and is no longer acceptable. In fact, manuscripts relying on such deficient science are not publishable in the journal for which I serve as editor. A bit on the oil spill literature. In studying spills in the lab, another key challenge is to decide on the environmental conditions to model. As it is impossible to model every scenario, they're virtually endless. Thus, the California program developed standard criteria for evaluating different dispersants to provide comparative rankings for use by responders. Since both toxicity and efficacy can be enhanced by increased mixing, values were derived using standard energy levels to provide relative rankings for dispersant products for decision-making purposes. And this is a key point here. The data that are generated by this sort of approach, while useful to responders, do not necessarily represent the actual numbers that might be observed in the field. And again, that's because the number of scenarios are virtually endless, and it all involves mixing. Unfortunately, over many years, deficient articles have been published comparing the toxicity of dispersed versus the undispersed oil. Uh, one such example that's hit uh, the press recently is one by the lead author, Rico Martinez et al., published in a journal, Environmental Pollution, in 2013, uh, 2013 which reports that Maconda crude oil dispersed with Corexit 9527 is 52 times more toxic than undispersed oil. The work is so deficient that our CrowSurf colleagues published a critique of, of the article a year later in Coelho et al., also in the same journal, 2013, where they cited some 10 major shortcomings. The methods represent technology decades out of date, yet the data receives press attention. Currently, much of the available dispersant literature is unreliable. However, based on the limited number of quality studies, it appears undispersed oil, dispersed oil, and dispersants alone, so the three different scenarios, are all moderately toxic within the same part per million range. Like all chemicals, they are not uniformly toxic to all species. As physiological and other differences, for instance, some species may ingest oil particles, also influence toxicity. For some species, dispersed oil may, may be more toxic, whereas for others, it may be undispersed oil. Our recent work in my laboratory using cutting-edge uh, MRI imaging technology suggests both types of oil are similarly toxic to at least juvenile salmon and top smelt. Thus, the picture is not real clear. Also, spill response choices must often consider which species or resources to protect at the cost of others, as no single choice can protect all species equally. Well, dispersants represent only one tool in the, in the responder's toolbox. Unlike the harsh industrial detergents used during the Torrey Canyon spill of the 1960s, dis current formulas used may, uh, use many of the same ingredients found in household cleaners, laundry detergents, hair shampoos, and some food project products. We domestically discharge large volumes daily without placing much thought into it. Interestingly, Environment Canada has found that both palm olive and sunlight dishwashing liquids to be some 10 to 25 times more toxic to rainbow trout than the core exits 9500 and 9527. <clears throat> While I'm neither a proponent nor opponent of dispersant use, I believe that spill response should remain pragmatic. While it would be optimal for Mother Nature to degrade a spill, usually important resources will be damaged during the process. For instance, during the Deepwater Horizon event, it quickly became clear that shoreline resources, such as wildlife refuges, recreation beaches, and areas important to the oyster and shrimp industries, would be significantly impacted. The only option available to divert the oil to areas deemed less sensitive was the use of dispersants ultimately applied at the conservative rate of 1% of the oil released. Had they not been available, the resultant shoreline damage could have been catastrophic. There may be specific events in the future when only certain tools will be capable of mitigating a potential disaster. Tying the hands of responders by removing tools from the toolbox in advance, especially when based on imperfect science, may only lead to unde undesirable consequences. Thank you for this opportunity, and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Well, it sounds like the 
stated, the research has, is not conclusive in terms of uh, if one were trying to make generalizations about use of dispersants versus not use of dispersants. Is that a fair, that's a, that's fair characterization fair. of what I uh, heard you say? Characterization. I think I think one of the problems is that is that much of the dispersant research that's gone on over the years is dependent upon the chemistry used to analyze the exposures or the toxicological information. And the chemistry used in previous years up until now has been relatively deficient in being able to parse out, if you will, what, whether dispersed oil or n naturally dispersed oil are the most toxic forms. Well, given, uh, given the wide variety of factors that you've mentioned that could uh, determine or, uh, uh, the, bene the, the bene benefit or damage of a particular strategy, um, is there uh, a research pathway that could lead or, or is leading towards uh, uh, helping decision makers determine which strategy is going to be the most beneficial to the environment or least damaging, you know, right. trying to reduce the damage? Right. And I, and I think the, the pathway that we had taken as part of CrowSurf and part of the California oil uh, project a number of years ago was the correct one in that in that you set up a standard ruler and then you measure all of the different dispersing agents whether it's for their toxicological consequences or their efficacy on that same ruler for instance we set up um, what was called a swirling flask test at the time which was an EPA test for efficiency um, and it was a low energy test but what it provided is it provided us a ranking of which dispersants were more efficient versus which were less efficient based upon that standard ruler. Now, when you go into the real world, going back to my blender example a minute ago, um, depending upon how much energy is in the environment, dispersion can be anywhere from 10 to 90 percent for any dispersant, but you won't know that from a standardized laboratory test. All you will know is the ranking of which ones tend to be more, most effective, which ones least as effective, and then that then will be influenced by the amount of sea state or the amount of energy that's in the environment itself. So it, it, it's almost impossible to model every possible environmental scenario that's out there for every spill. And so the basic approach that we took was to simply set up a ruler and compare all the agents against that standard ruler so that we at least had a relative ranking of which agents are more effective, which agents are probably not as effective. Understanding that, let's say, um, the most effective agent works out to be 20% on that test, in the real world, with a lot more environmental energy, sea state conditions, et cetera, that real world efficiency may be 80 or 90% because of the difference in the energy of the environment versus the standardized energy of the laboratory test. Thank you. Good. I, I think I understand where that was going, which was, which was a question that I had. Sure. Because, and is what you're talking about, and again, if I duplicate what was asked earlier, I'm, I, I do apologize. Yeah. But the, and the notion with dispersants is to protect more sensitive areas like sea mammals and sea birds and, and then send that oil where it would have arguably less impact, but and that's generally to sink it. Isn't that correct? Is that what dispersants typically right. do? Right. Dispersants basically put the oil into the water column instead of keeping it near the surface as a surface sheen. Yes. Right. And and in as you said, Mother Nature ultimately cleans up the oil, and, and that's typically what happens to the oil in a lot of wave action, heavy sea state. Does it tend to then put it deeper into the water column and eventually sinks? Um, some of it will sink. The really heavy, what we call asphaltines, this type yeah. of stuff you make roadways out of, will sink. Um, for the most part, what will happen is the lighter parts will stay in the water column. Um, whether it's uh, oil is broken up by wave action or broken up by dispersants, ultimately what will happen in the long run is that it will eventually dissolve, be degraded by sunlight, and or be degraded by bacterial digestion over time. Mm -hmm. um, and that will happen whether you use the dispersant or not. It's just that the dispersants in some cases can enhance that process. But the other key factor there is that, is that often when you're looking at an oil spill, you're looking at multiple resources that you have to protect. And, and in, in most cases, you deem some resources being most critical, some less critical. And often you'll use a response technique like a dispersant to shift that oil away from the areas that you don't want it to go toward the areas that you deem um, are more resilient and, and could potentially take the hit a little bit better than than those others. And that's what happened with Deepwater Horizon. The idea there was uh, we deemed the shoreline areas to be the most critical to protect 
via the various resources, and the offshore areas to be a little bit less critical and more resilient. Now, that doesn't mean there won't be impacts in both places, no matter what your decision is. So there's no sort of perfect solution here. You either you either have impacts in one place or the other, and the idea here is, is where do you sort of lessen the overall impact by directing the spill a certain way. And so dispersants then are really accelerating that process. Yes. Once that decision's been made, right. where the least impact is going to be, right. accelerate the process. Yes. All right. Good. Thank you. Thank you to that panel.